good afternoon to all our friends that have joined us today. On behalf of Badminton Pan America Confederation, welcome, we welcome you all to a new setup of presentation focused on sports science research done in our sport. My name is Mario Carrera, and I'm pleased to be the moderator of today's session. Before introducing the topic of today and our speaker, let me quickly run through our family rules. I will address to our Spanish speaking community now. Para quienes se acaban de conectar, por favor encuentren la opción de traducción, de traducción simultánea en la parte baja de sus pantallas, indicado como interpretación. Les recomendamos utilizar audífonos y silenciar el audio original para mejorar la calidad del sonido. Now, I will address to our French speaking community. Puede trouver la opción de traducción simultánea o va de vos ecran, indique con interpretación. Nous vous recommandons d'utiliser un casque découpé le son d'origine pour améliorer la qualité du son. If you have any questions or comments, we invite you to write them down using the chat function located on the right side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end. Before starting with today's topic, we have a special guest, Mr. David Cabello. David is the chair of the Development and Sport for All Committee from Badminton World Federation. He initiated the BWF Research Grants Program and advocated for scientific studies to be undertaken to develop innovative equipment for outdoor badminton. Also, he is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Sports Science at the University of Granada, has a PhD in physical education exercise and sports science from the University of Granada. David will explain us the, the opportunities that BWF offers through research grants. Welcome, David. It's our honor to have you here. Hi, hi, Mario. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, bonjour. Uh, well, uh, as you know, I'm uh, Spanish, but I'm going to do my sole presentation uh, in English to do it to the full record of the session to be published uh, with the keynote uh, guest uh, today. Well, uh, first of all, I really would like to thank uh, Panam Badminton Confederation for the invitation to participate in this uh, great uh, initiative. Uh, secondly, I would also like to congratulate Panam Badminton and all the people who has already participated in the previous conferences or webinars. <coughs> Definitely, uh, we are facing a very strange and difficult time due to this uh, pandemic, but this uh, initiative, these uh, webinars uh, are keeping contact with our colleagues and uh, we are having the chance to continue educating uh, ourselves. Uh, I have only six, eight minutes to convince you how important is science in a sport and particularly in badminton. So I would like to add some more background to explain to all of you the vision and the overall goal of the Sports Science uh, Commission and why and how we put it in place in 2010 in uh, Badminton World Federation in BWF. As a former badminton player and later a badminton coach, I study a degree in physical education and sports science, as Mario has already mentioned. And it was really when I realized that uh, there were only a few published scientific uh, research or papers uh, about uh, badminton, let's say worldwide, uh, in English and in French, uh, probably some, something in Chinese that uh, we were not able to fine, but uh, it was really uh, difficult to, to get um, uh, an important number of uh, research uh, in, in our sport in, in different fields. If you particularly compared with other sport and also even with uh, racket sport, ten, ten, table tennis or tennis. So 
I decided to do my PhD in badminton, uh, and that was the, the first uh, uh, thesis in, Spa in, in, in Spain, but, or Spanish language, related to badminton. Uh, just, let's say, 20 years ago now, <laughs> which is a long time ago. And it was just exactly at the same time that I also started as high performance director of uh, Badminton Spain, the National Badminton Federation. Uh, from the beginning of our involvement in Spain, and particularly when I was elected as president of uh, the National Badminton Federation, we really worked always applying science and innovation that really allow us to move forward much quickly. So I really could affirm or confirm that uh, a very high percentage of the success of badminton in Spain, it has been the scientific research and innovation approach that we have applied to all areas of the sport very successfully in the last 20 years. Then when I was elected as a BWF uh, executive board member and chair of development, uh, one of my priority was to set up a sports science commission with the key badminton researchers uh, around the world. Uh, and it was in 2010, one year after. And one of the main strategies was also to incentivize researching in badminton to definitely increase the number of studies and the quantity or quality of the research in our sport. And I really would like to, to give you some figures uh, at the end of my, of my speech, but uh, I really would like also to highlight the three main objectives of our uh, research grant, which is the tool that we decided to implement to increase the, the quality and the quantity of uh, research in our sport. The first one is to encourage and widen interest and investment in applied research in badminton. The second one is to improve the level and quantity of scientific material available to players, to coaches, and all badminton practitioners. And the third one is to contribute towards the increased knowledge of performance and safety at the international level of players, but also of coaches. Honestly, I really would like to highlight that uh, BWF Research Grant Initiative started in 2013 to support research institutions globally to conduct research connected to badminton, which is uh, something that uh, has been really very successful and I would like to give you a few uh, data at the end. Uh, all the projects that we have supported through the research grant and their funding are then shared to coaches and relevant groups through scientific publication published on the BWF website, coaching conference, and any many other uh, platforms. Furthermore, the researchers are also invited to submit the projects to be published in the new International Journal of Racket Sports Science that BWF is supporting in collaboration with the International Table Tennis Federation and International Tennis Federation and Sun Universities. Invited uh, really, I really would like to invite coaches and researchers in the region to present their research projects to the BWF Research Grants Program. The application process for these grants, it's open every year around February, and all information is available in our development uh, BWF uh, badminton site. Please, to finish my intervention today, I really would like to highlight a few figures that uh, really uh, remark how important it has been 
uh, this uh, important program. Let's say that uh, we have been working uh, eight years of, uh, with the research grants with a total of 70 projects supported through nearly a total investment of 700,000 US dollars. During these eight years of research grant support, it has increased more than 100% the number of badminton papers published in scientific journals, which means that we have for all the coaches, for all the players, and for all the badminton uh, practitioners or participants, we have much more uh, information available. You know that this pandemic has also uh, show us how important is science and uh, we should continue working in that area to increase the scientific profile of our sport to be sure that we are um, giving a much better uh, opportunity to perform in our sport. So once again, and that's the final remark that I would like to do today, is to be sure that um, I really encourage all of you to participate in any opportunity to research in our sport. And of course, to join any team, any uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary team that uh, would like to uh, apply for our BWF research grant. And of course, to encourage you again to go to our uh, education and uh, development uh, uh, website, BWF site, to uh, check all the uh, available for free um, information and funding of the different research that we have supported through the BWF research grant. So thank you again for inviting me. I'm sure that you will join or will enjoy uh, the conference of today with one of our uh, sports science uh, uh, commission members. And I would like again to uh, uh, congratulate uh, pa Badminton Panan, uh, Germán, uh, Juan Pablo, Mario for this uh, initiative. And I would like also to send a, a great uh, a hug to all our friends uh, in Panan and in the rest of the world that are uh, today just watching us. Uh, un saludo muy fuerte también para todos mis amigos latinoamericanos y os espero en próxima conferencia. Thank you so much and enjoy the afternoon or evening uh, everywhere. Bye. Bye. Thank you, David, uh, for this very important information uh, for our friends all interested in doing research studies in our sport. Uh, now getting back for on today's presentation, we have the pleasure of having one of the most emblematic personalities of badminton, Mr. Mark King, uh, university professor from Loughborough University, which is rated number one in the world for sports related subjects. Mark will guide us through today's topic optimum performance in the badminton jump smash. But first, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Mark is chair of the International Society of Biomechanics Technical Group on Computer Simulation. Also, he is Associate, Associate Dean for Enterprise in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Science at Loughborough University. Recently, he has been awarded the position of Fellow of the International Society of Biomechanics in Sport. Without further ado, Mark, it is our honor to have you here. The floor is yours. Uh, we kindly ask you to share your screen and take control over the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Mario. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. It's and on. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pan America Badminton for inviting me and of course, Badminton World Federation. We're gonna talk about the Badminton Jump Smash today. And my challenge firstly is to make you think. 
You all play and coach badminton, I'm sure, and you all can play the jump smash. But do you, you know what do you know about it and how can we make it better? That's the challenge for me in this presentation. So a bit about my, my background. Well, I'm a sports biomechanist and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And um, I've been at Loughborough University in the UK for 30 years, which is really hard to believe. I came here 30 years ago as a, an undergraduate student and um, loved maths and was okay at sport and um, combined the two together as a sports biomechanist. Badminton wise, you know, I was never a professional player, but I got to the you know, reasonable level in the UK and um, certainly it's my passion. And through my academic career, my passion has always been around elite performance research. I've done this in a variety of sports and using a variety of different techniques. But obviously the one that I'm most passionate about is the one that I enjoy the most, and that's badminton. So what is sports biomechanics? Well, I use maths to explain movement in sport. So I use mechanics to understand what's mechanically going on in a movement. Now try and identify what's really important. Everybody's different. Everybody's a different size and shape and strength. But there are some factors that are really critical if you're going to perform well. And there's two sides to biomechanics. There's the performance side, but also the injury side. And in today's presentation, we're going to focus on performance. Well, my philosophy around that is that there are some factors that are critical for elite performance. But there are lots of other things. If you look at an elite performer, say you take one of the best players in the world, and those factors aren't important. And my challenge as a biomechanist is to understand what are those factors that are critical. In other words, without those factors, you won't have a good performance. And that's what I try and do as a biomechanist, to then work with a coach to help improve a player's performance. Well, today we're talking about the badminton smash, but more generically, if we think about the movement, it's a type of throwing overhead skill. And what can we learn more generally about those? Well, some examples here. Some of you may know cricket, uh, a very English sport, but there's fast bowling in cricket. We then got baseball pitching, which maybe more of you are familiar with, the tennis serve, and of course, the badminton smash. And in terms of what does optimum performance really mean? Well, of course it's speed, but it's also about direction and angle and also accuracy. And for most of today's presentation, we'll focus on speed, the most exciting part, one could argue. Well, if we start, look through these in order, then cricket fast bowling starts with the run up. So you might think they can bowl really, really fast. Well, they can, but compared to the others, they're the slowest. So 160 kilometers an hour, 100 miles an hour is really fast in cricket. And that's the limit. We then look at baseball pitching. Even without a run up, we get a slightly quicker speed. And that's because in cricket, they have to keep their arms straight, whereas in baseball pitching, they can bend at the elbow. If we then give the person an implement, in this case, a tennis racket, we can increase that up to 260 odd kilometers an hour. But interestingly, this player, who's the fastest, isn't one of the very best in the world at tennis. And of course, the badminton, the one we're all interested in, is by far and away the fastest. Badminton is the fastest racket sport in the world. And the fastest recorded in gameplay is 426 kilometers an hour. But if we took some of the values from that, you know, those, that play, we see there's a range of speeds that men and women can produce. You know, the very best in the world from a smash perspective in the male, in the men's game, get over 400 kilometers an hour. But there are loads of elite players who get to 350 plus. And then on the women's side, they're about 50 to 75 kilometers an hour slower. And 
for me as a biomechanist, this only gives me questions. And that's what research is about. Research is about answering questions. So what are some of the questions? Simply, why can some players smash much faster than others? You can't, there would be no one you could speak to who had said they want to smash slower. Everybody would aspire to smash faster. For me personally, the thing that stopped me being a better badminton player was my smash. The rest of my game was pretty good, but my smash was pretty average. Why is that? Is it just that I wasn't strong enough? Is it something to do with my technique? What can I understand about that? And then one thing that's really important sometimes for a coach is to understand the limits of the person in front of you that you're coaching. In other words, you're not trying to coach them to be something they'll never be. You know, in 100 meter racing, you know, if you're never going to be a sprinter, then don't try and make them run the 100 meters. Find what sport's good for them. In badminton, if you're never going to have a big, a good smash, then focus on the other aspects of the game that you can improve. Understand the limits of the person in front of you. And then more generically, and a lot of this presentation will start to say, well, what does optimum look like for a smash? Can we really understand it? Remember those factors that are important. What are those critical factors in the smash that you must do if you're going to have a good smash? And then perhaps the most important, and I'll touch on this right at the end, how can we coach young players to have a good smash, the best smash, their optimum smash? What's that progression from being a younger player to a senior player? What does performance look like? So hopefully by the end of this presentation, we will have answered some of these questions, but I also have challenged you to think and think about your players and how you coach them and how could they be better? So I'm gonna start with a question. Here's a video, you can't tell who it is because this is in my biomechanical environment of a smash. For this player, is this optimum technique? It's certainly a pretty good smash. It's well over 350 kilometers an hour. Could this player perform any better? How would we coach this player? Is this their limit? These are the sort of questions that I want to understand and answer. So this led us on to the first BWF Smash project. Uh, this was a few years ago now. Um, in many respects, a pilot for the second study, which we'll come on to after the break. And this was to start to understand what's happening. And in this, you know, we were starting to say, well, how can we even follow the shuttle? It goes at 400 kilometers an hour and it changes that speed in one millisecond. Where does the shuttle even hit on the racket? What aspects of technique, what are those factors that might be important as well as accuracy? So this is the data collection environment for the first study. It doesn't really look like a proper badminton court, although the, it, it, there was a badminton court here, but this is my dining hall at Loughborough University. I'm fortunate that I'm the warden of a hall of residence, Royce Hall, and with that, where all the students eat, I can move all the tables out of the way and set up a badminton court. So we set up a very expensive motion analysis system to collect badminton data on the badminton jump smash in my dining hall, um, which was quite ironic, I think. And the pictures on the right. So here we can see a player marked up. We put reflective markers all over the body, as well as putting a bit of tape on the shuttle and reflective markers on the racket. And we can track these really accurately to within a, very, a few millimeters throughout the movement. And we ask the players to do what they do best, which is to perform the jump smash. So here's one of the people in the subject. So we had a range of good national level uh, players hitting the jump smash. And from that, we could then start to understand, well, what techniques are they using? across the group. We see in the background, these cameras here, these are tracking the markers on the body at 400 pictures per second. Well, from that movement, what we see is actually just the dots. So we track all of those dots on the body. 
And we can start to see that this looks like that player's smash. We can then join the dots up. This is 3D dot the dot. Many of you will have, when you were a kid, done 2D dot the dot. My students um, don't exactly enjoy this too much, but 3D dot the dot. And because we know where we've put all those markers on the body, we can then drop a skeleton onto that. So we accurately understand what's happening at the different joints in the body. Well, there's so much data there, we need to tease out some critical instance. So if this is the smash, what points would be most interested in? Well, we could start off at the beginning of the movement is how much they flex their knees to start the preparation for the jump. So the preparation phase. We've then got the racket lowest point behind the body before they then swing the racket forwards. That's another critical point. And obviously contact between the racket and the shuttle. So we've got this phase in the smash from preparation through to racket contact with the racket lowest point in between. So if we took all of that data for a range of good national level players, what did we find? What contributed to speed? Well, there were three key variables that came out of this. One was around shoulder internal rotation, which probably most of you have heard about. One was about then counter rotation of the trunk relative to the pelvis, called the X factor, which has been linked to performance in other hitting sports like golf. And then we've also got a very rapid acceleration of the racket in a very short period of time. And I'll show you that graphically and I'll go through these one by one. So firstly, shoulder internal rotation. Those that had more internal rotation at contact smash faster. And on this picture here, the one on the left, this graph is showing all of the data across all the participants. And the, the solid line here is the average. And then the shaded area is the standard deviation around that. And I'm not going to go into any of the maths here, I promise. But on the right here, I've picked out two people from the study. The solid line is the fastest smash in the study. And the dotted line is the slowest person. And if we see, this period is from preparation through to shuttle contact. And what we see here in the solid line is we have a counter movement followed by a rapid internal rotation through to a much higher ro internal rotated shoulder position of the upper arm at contact. And this was linked to speed. Those that could internally rotate more through to the point of contact could smash faster. And this work has been papered, as, uh, has been published, uh, just like David was saying in academic journals, and it's available there at the link below if you want to look at that in more detail. So that was the first result. This was a key factor to smash speed. The second one was around counter rotation of the trunk relative to the pelvis, which we call trunk twist or this X factor measurement. And again, the same format, the average, all the data and the average on the left, but on the right, the fastest and slowest. And we can quite clearly see that the faster player counter rotates more. But the important thing to say, and this is true across many sports, yes, this counter rotation is important, but you must then get and complete the movement through to contact. So in other words, if you're not careful, you could counter rotate too far if you weren't then able to smash effectively. The counter rotation is a clear factor that's important for the trunk relative to the pelvis, this X factor. And then the last factor that came out very strongly in this first study was around the acceleration of the racket. So again, on the left, we've got all of the data. And this is racket head speed as of between preparation and shuttle contact. And then on the right, we've got the fastest and slowest smash. And what we see here is the person who smashes fast has a much later and faster rapid acceleration of the racket. So the rate of change of this line is acceleration. So this buildup of velocity occurs very, very quickly right at the end. Whereas the person who smashed slower 
started the movement from this racket lowest point, but was much slower, much less acceleration, slower acceleration through to a, ultimately a lower racket head speed at contact. And racket head speed is very strongly linked to shuttle speed. So this was quite, and this has been true across many people we've seen, the people who smash fastest have a much faster acceleration at the end of the swing. So I've given you a taster for what's important, but I'm gonna now ask you all a question and I will hand over to the organizers to um, ask that question of you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. We'll have a, a trivia for our aud audience prepared by Mark, so be ready. So the trivia for today is, according to the figures, which figures show the fastest smash? So check it wisely and please put your answers on the chat. Okay, we're having a variety of answers. We'll have uh, 10 more seconds. Look at the pictures. And as you can see, the answer is A. So congratulations to all who got it right. And uh, please Mark, continue with this uh, very interesting presentation. Okay, so um, let me see if I can share my screen again now. Yes. Um, here we go. So well done if you got that right. And that's uh, data from a, a recent study that's um, um, been in the process of being published and um, you'll be able to see that in, in due course. So the second part of this presentation was a second BWF project um, that built on the first, but collected data on some very elite uh, performance. We wanted We'd done that pilot work in my dining hall, if you like, and we wanted to now you know, go to you know, the best players we could in the world. And thank you for BWF for all their support in helping us with that. And so that started at the All England Badminton Championships in 2016, where we could set up on the practice course. And then we moved on to two other data collections, which I'll explain. And what we wanted to do is to really understand what the very best do. Because if we're going to understand the smash, we want to know what the best do. You know, and some of this work is still ongoing, but what, how do they compare male to female, perhaps even for different you know, parts of the world where they're coached differently, but fundamentally understanding technique, speed, and accuracy. So this is from the All England Championships uh, set up on the practice courts. Um, and this was one of the players Hopefully it will play. So the same setup, the same system, but instead of Royce Dining Hall, this is the practice courts in Birmingham in the UK, the All England. We've got all the cameras around the top recording what the player does at 400 pictures per second. We then move on and you know many thanks to um, the organizers at badminton england who allowed us access to pretty much all of their top players again we took the same system and this is uh, the home of badminton in milton Keynes. so we build up a really elite data set Another one of the elite players. And this one I'm showing because it shows the trials and tribulations of trying to collect data. You'll notice in the background, Adris, who's the PhD student on this project, um, trying to keep the data collection environment set up. But Marcus on this smash manages to knock all three tubes over. And of course, he's then a bit distracted and Adris is trying to set the tubes up. And I think Marcus is trying to hit him in the end. But 
Anyway, no one was injured in this data collection. And then another one of the elite performers. Oh, let's see if this one will play just to finish off. So we're building up this repertoire. And if you notice, if you look at all these smashes, they're all really good, but they're all different. Well, what's best? And we go through the same process of analyzing the data. We then were very fortunate, and thank you again for BWF to supporting this. We went up to Glasgow and the World Badminton Champs and set up on the practice court here. This time we've got a, a much higher speed camera recording accurately. We can see this smash here. We've got data on over 50 of the people competing at the World Badminton Champs. So, on to the results from that. Well, across the vast majority of the people we collected data on there, these are the sorts of speeds we were getting. So we just failed to reach 400 kilometers an hour, but this is in a different measurement system, if you like, to what we saw earlier. But we've got very high speeds, and we can see here this differential quite clearly showing between 50 and 75 kilometers an hour between the female elite players and the male. I've also got the angle of the smash relative to the horizontal, so they're smashing downwards. And again, the males jump higher, they're able to smash more steeply. Well, I didn't really talk about it in the first presentation of part of this, but one of the challenges in badminton is things are really fast and happen in really quick time. In fact, in badminton, we go, the shuttle goes from naught 400 kilometers an hour in one millisecond. The shuttle's in contact with the racket for approximately one millisecond. That's a huge acceleration and a really challenge for any environment to try and work out what's happening. And in the background, when we process that data, there's lots of equations and a curve fitting method that we use. And I'm not going to go into any of the equations here, but it would you know, it's needless to say, it's a bit complex. But what it does is it allows us to accurately calculate where the shuttle hits the racket in that one millisecond and what happens to the, the shuttle and how we can get up to those speeds. And this picture on the right here shows where we did some accuracy measurements early in the process. And we can work out where the shuttle hits the racket with a small error of three or four millimeters. So one of the first questions that I thought you might be interested to look at, and if we had another question round, I would say, well, do the performers hit the shuttle out of the middle of the racket? You might think yes, you might think no. Well, if we took all of the data we've collected, this is what we see. So this is looking towards a right-handed player, if you like. So this side is the head, and this is the racket facing you. And what we find is they don't hit in the middle they hit slightly off center. And this is because the person is pronating and supinating. So if you imagine the racket is your hand and you'll see my hand here, so I can just try and demonstrate. As they hit, they move this way. So in other words, the thumb side of the racket that I'm holding is moving quicker than the little finger side. Well, that corresponds here to the players, not knowing, I don't think, but they hit slightly off center which was interesting. And here is some of the data. This is the fastest smash from everyone in the study. And then this is the data from 95 to 100% and then 90 to 95. And we can see the groupings is just slightly off center. We do this as a heat map, um, which we often see it, you know, as a way to graphically represent things. The center of the red is where it's the fastest place to hit, through to obviously miss hits around the edge. We can quite clearly see that it's just soft center. Again, there's a second paper here published at the bottom if you want to read the detail behind this. Well, as well as speed, there's also the angle, the accuracy. And if we now treat just look vertically across all those impacts and look where they go, then you'll notice that the darkest line 
is one string off the center. And that's where the shuttle goes exactly where they think it's going to go. And that's normal to the racket face, perpendicular to it. As you deviate either side, the shuttle starts to spray off in different directions. Well, what does that mean in terms of where the shuttle might go? Well, if we think about a small deviation on the racket, what would happen by the time it reaches the other side of the court? Would you hit the line or miss? Well, each of these bars here, each of these different colors represents 25 centimeters distance on the court. And we can see that the majority of the data goes plus or minus 25, but there is some data. And by the time we get to three standard deviations, that's basically all of the data where the shuttle will go in quite a different place to where we would have expected it to. So impact location on the racket has a big influence on where the shuttle goes, independent of anything else that the player might be trying to do. So impact location is important. So we haven't really said where does, how do we build up this speed? Well, I'm going to try and show you this graphically. And here's a sequence and you'll see if I slow it down, play through different parts of the body lighting up with different colors so here's the start and this was just a typical trial by one of our fastest players smashing so the jump up and then we start to see the trunk go red and that's indicating that it's moving quickly it starts off red but then it goes to a, a lighter color and now the arm is going to a redder color. You can see it's already gone through the reds here now. We keep going and here, it's hard to see because it's very thin, but the red part is here now and the trunk has slowed down. And that's that buildup of speed during the smash. Well, I've tried to pick out those pictures and we see the speed starts in the trunk and then follows through to the racket and the shuttle, ultimately. So the trunk is really critical when we think about those factors that are important when we're doing the smash. Indeed, this was one of the distinguishing factors between those that smash faster and those that smash slower in the group. The people who fast smashed faster had more trunk rotation and more trunk flexion. So that's pulling the trunk forwards as well as the twist. So the twist of the trunk, but also the flexion of the trunk. That was critical. And graphically, you know, this data isn't published yet, but will be in due course. We have these relationships, the trunk axle rotation and trunk flexion. So on the vertical axis here on both of them, We've got speed of the racket in meters per second, and then we've got the contribution to speed in meters per second from each of these two. But we get across the whole data set, a good linear relationship, more trunk flexion, more axial rotation leads to a faster smash. Well, we know the fastest point of the, the smash is at contact. And if we think, well, what body movements have contributed, what joints contribute to the smash, it starts to, again, in a different way, emphasize what's important. Well, shoulder internal rotation gives an approximate contribution of about 40% to the smash. It is the most important factor. The next, from what the data that we've collected, is the wrist, in terms of how the wrist flex forwards at contact. We know the racket moves through a big range of motion just before contact. And that is done by the wrist, so we get a contribution from the wrist. Then the next one that has a much smaller component, but still arguably important to a certain extent, is the movement of the, the upper arm from backwards to forwards. So this is in the direction the person is smashing. This we call shoulder horizontal flexion. So how the arm is moved from back to in front. 
And that gives us a smaller contribution relative to the others at about 10%. The thing that's interesting here, to me anyway, is that the elbow, the movement of the elbow doesn't make a big difference. So when people are often learning to smash, there's perhaps an emphasis on trying to extend the elbow. You actually find that elbow extension has a very small contribution. In fact, it's really putting the elbow in the right location so that the effect of shoulder internal rotation can be maximized. So the elbow isn't fully extended at impact. In fact, um, we've found that those that don't fully extend smash faster. And then the pronation, you know, which all people do, this twisting of the, the racket and the arm, is more, we think, to do with getting the racket in the right place rather than producing any contribution from a velocity perspective. And then lastly, yes, the racket does matter. I get the right racket for you, and you can have a small proportion of your speed from there. And that we found is a you know, five or 6% contribution to the speed. So hopefully I've started to make you think about the smash. Well, these were the questions that I posed at the beginning. Well, Hopefully we've got a good appreciation or starting to think about the relationship between technique and performance. So we saw shoulder internal rotation, we saw the X factor, wrist flexion, etc. We have an idea of what optimum looks like, the relationship, and we saw the, that color sequence of the buildup of speed from the trunk through into the arm. The other bits are work in progress. So if you're stronger, will you smash faster? Which is more important, strength or technique? Other work we've done in other sports would suggest that technique is the most important factor. And strength can add a little bit, but not be more important than technique. And I suspect the same is true in the badminton smash. What is the limit for an individual? That's a tough question and we'll need a different sort of methodology to answer it. In other sports, we've used computer modeling to understand what this looks like. But that's, uh, in, we're not there yet with badminton, with plenty of work still to do. And I'm going to finish with this last one. How can we coach young players to smash faster? Well, we know what optimum looks like for the elite. We don't necessarily know what the progression is, but we know what factors to encourage. And work we've done in other sports would say, you know, being really confident how to coach someone is challenging. But when you see people with the right attributes, encourage them. And I'm going to finish, or well, just about finish, was this was when we were collecting data in Royce. And this was my youngest son having a go. Uh, so this was when he was about 10. So he's got all the markers on his body and he's having a bit of fun and then seeing what his smash looks like. My challenge to all of you is how can we coach our young players to reach their potential, whatever it is? Of course, this sort of work is not possible without the support and help of a lot of people. Um, and I apologize if I've missed you off here, but here's a list of the people at the top that have been very much involved from Harley and Adriz, who are current PhD students on badminton projects. Stuart, Ramanda and Paul, who have um, now completed their PhDs and moved on to better things, but still involved. Um, Jakob Hoy, who was the national coach of Badminton England um, when I first, uh, when we went down there to collect the data and he helped organize that. Stefan, who's now working with um, in Loughborough. Uh, Atu, who was helping, you might have noticed her in the data at the All England Champs. And Yash is a current MSc student who's doing some of the latest work. And Yuvraj and Vishwanath are um, in Malaysia and we're working with them on a current project. And of course, people at Badminton England, as well as Badminton World Federation, who've helped support this work. And of course, all the players involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been really interesting. Uh, now we will move to the questions and answer round. Please, if you have any question, use the chat and I will pass it to our 
speaker. We have uh, um, we have a question from Jose Maria. Uh, what other variables help to the production of a more powerful smash, uh, more flexible material on the racket? I think you mentioned about racket stability, but uh, what about string tension? Have you looked uh, about it? Of course, all together with the muscular chain involved in all in all the the swing. So uh, there hasn't been a lot done on badminton, but certainly the work that's done in in tennis would suggest that a string tension that isn't the very tight tissue can have will produce you know a greater return of that elastic energy. And we're doing some work at the moment to look at that and finalise that in badminton. But all the top players string their rackets really, really tight. The thing that's challenging in badminton is the, sh the contact time is really short. And so it's not 100% clear, you know, how much of that energy that you put into the strings can actually be returned. So there's a bit more to be done. But, you know, the thought process at the moment out there would be st strings that are slightly slacker that allow the, the contact time to be perhaps slightly longer, give more time for the speed to be produced. But I don't think the jury's completely certain on this one at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, during your research, uh, have you found any difference between a left or a right-handed player producing the... So, uh, I think the short answer to that is no. I mean, there were, so this data that I've presented here has a combination of left and right-handed players within it. Um, obviously, so I'd say from a pure speed perspective, there's no evidence to think that left-handed players can smash faster, smash faster, for example. Um, I certainly think it's harder to play against a left-handed player simply because you don't play against as many of them. But in terms of pure speed, no, I don't think there's a difference. Okay, uh, we have a question from John. It's asking if the shuttle speed relies on internal sho shoulder rotation, trunk twist and racket swing, uh, does this mean the jumping only affects angle and not speed of smash? So I think that that's a good question. Um, I think in theory, you can smash just as fast whether you jump or not but it certainly allows you through jumping to hit more steeply. But what we found in some of the work we've done is that if you want to smash as fast as possible, you don't reach up as high as possible. It's a bit like if you stood still and wanted to throw a ball as fast as possible, would you re try and let go of the ball at the highest possible point you could reach? The answer is no, you wouldn't. It would be lower than that. And we see the same in the smash. So your shoulder isn't, or your arm isn't vertically above when you've made contact. It's at a lower position. We have a, something called a shoulder elevation angle. And the, a slightly lower arm gives a slightly quicker speed. But the jump allows us to get the angle. Okay. So we don't have to reach up quite as high. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Juvarash. Juvarash? Sorry if I mispronounce it. Uh, he wants to know where is the best position to perform a jump smash in court? I don't know if you have uh, <laughs> looked at it during your evaluation. So the, uh, wherever it doesn't come back, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it depends. There's, there's, you know, shot choice um, on court, you know, the sh the reality is the shuttle slows down very quickly once you've hit it. So the further back you are in court, the harder it is for your smash to be effective. Um, okay. So uh, I think it's a whole different ball game to say where on court should you use the smash from. That's, uh, yeah. You could ask the coaches that one. <laughs> um, we have, a, I'm going to try to join two questions. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, in your experience, um, which exercise you recommend to prepare athletes to exercise a, a stronger, let's say a stronger smash on also, or uh, what muscles must be developed to improve the smash? Okay, so uh, I'm not a strength and conditioning coach, but certainly from, from playing, I know which muscles hurt when I do a lot of smashing. And if you don't have a very good smash like me, you tend to do a lot of smashing because it takes you a while to win the rally. 
But you know, if you think about the musculature at the shoulder, it's the shoulders around the back of the shoulder that typically take the strain in the smash. And that's because they're being stretched eccentrically to slow the arm down. So the muscles around the front of the shoulder are typically quite strong because that's what you're using them to, to generate the speed. But it's the slowing down muscles that are stretched eccentrically. So we, it's quite often the case, you know, that that's the focus of attention, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe from an injury prevention as much as from a performance aspect, but trying to keep the shoulder muscles strong around the back. But uh, I'm, I'm, you'd have to ask a, a strength and conditioning coach. And, you know, as sports science develops, you'll see a much stronger relationship. We're seeing it in the sports now between what the SNC coach does and what the sports scientist, the biomechanist knows. Because what's happening in sports as we get more optimal is that all players have good conditioning. But now we're wanting to have more individual and specific conditioning for performance. And that requires a really close synergy between what the, the sports biomechanist knows and what the strength and conditioning coach knows so that we train the muscles in the right training zones. So if a muscle is being shortened really fast when we smash, if we need to, that muscle to be strong, we need to train it at the right intensity and at the right speed. So that's the link between the biomechanist and the strength and conditioning coach um, is only going to increase as we move forwards. Okay, uh, we have a question from Shannon. Uh, how did you calculate the contribution of different body segments, angles to the speed of the smash? Okay, so the contributions bit I showed you was at contact. So essentially we took all of the data from all of the players and looked at the contributions from each of the joints at the point of contact. And this has been used in other sports uh, like the tennis serve. And it starts to indicate which joints are important. It's not the full picture because you've got to get the joints to that position, which is why I tried to show you it two different ways. We saw the buildup of speed, but then looking at the contributions of the joint at, uh, at contact as well. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, we have another question. Uh, let me translate it. Um, have you found, have you seen any relation on how the fatigue can uh, influence or affect uh, reaching high speeds at the smash? So we didn't look at fatigue specifically here, but the players um, were typically doing between 40 and 50 smashes within this, um, when they were part of this study. And uh, we certainly didn't see any evidence of fatigue. So some players hit their fastest smash at the end of the data collection, for example. Um, obviously, in a game, um, you know, fatigue can play a, a role. Um, and there's, there's work to do in the future to say, well, what breaks down from a performance perspective or technique perspective as a player becomes fatigued? Does everything just slow down and their smash slow down? Or does some muscle groups get a more local fatigue. We don't know the answer to that at this point. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, David, um, which is the joint that sustained the most pressure or stress in a jump smash? Well, the joint that's contributing most from a velocity perspective is the shoulder and internal rotation. Um, but I think many people on the call here will be familiar with getting elbow problems and what we'd call tennis elbow, for example. So um, I don't think there's just one joint. Uh, I think um, the whole of the arm um, it takes a lot of wear and tear uh, in badminton and um, certainly it needs to be protected. Okay, um, we have a question from Carlos. I uh, will translate it. Um... Uh, yeah, he thank you for sharing your research, and uh, he's asking about the the jump. Uh, um, he's referring to the transfer of force from the floor. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if you if you have more time to accelerate the again the trunk, the arm, and the forearm if it will influence into speeding up that movement? So the, the, what I tried to say in the presentation was that one of the things that surprised us was um, 
how the racket accelerated really fast in a short period of time for the people who smashed faster. And the reason we were surprised, or I was surprised with that is, there are two ways to get to an end point that's fast. It's either exert higher forces, or is exert forces over a longer period of time. And it seems quite clear that elite badminton players exert force over a short period of time, which has to mean they're exerting really high forces. So that build up of speed is produced really, really quickly. Whereas the people who didn't smash as fast use time. They had a long, they started their swing earlier, but it took a much, you know, a more gradual buildup of speed. So in other words, they weren't able to exert as much force or to get that contribution from the different joints. And so, you know, as a general rule, you know, to, to generate essentially velocity, you've got to apply an impulse, which is force multiplied by time. Elite players are doing that, are choosing not to use time to their advantage, they're choosing to use high forces. Okay. Uh... Time is uh, getting up, uh, catching us. Uh, we'll go through a final question. Um, have you any results about the relation of the articulation speed, like elbow extension speed and the smash speed? So the elbow, and this, this came out from both studies, was surprisingly not really contributing to speed. And I, I tried to explain it in the presentation but what it, we see at the elbow is it's, it's almost putting the elbow in the right place so that shoulder internal rotation have a maximum effect on the racket velocity. So if you imagine the elbow bent to 90 degrees, then if you shoulder internal return and rotate, that will have the maximum speed of the racket. Whereas if the elbow is straight and you internally rotate, you get no increase in speed. You get no speed at all, in fact. And so it seems that the, the contribution of the elbow isn't a direct contribution by actively producing speed itself, but seems to be about positioning the rest of the arm to make the biggest, to have the biggest contribution from the shoulder. It's okay. to do with levers, essentially. Okay, uh, it's perfect. Thank you very much for your lecture, Mark. Um, any final comment? No, it's an, it's an absolute pleasure. I've not done one of these before, so I really do hope it's come across um, well. And, um, you know, um, I hope I can you know, visit you in the future and uh, you know, talk this through with you more. But, um, yeah, I, I just hope the presentation has come across and I hope you found it interesting. Yes, it has been uh, really interesting, Mark. Uh, Please, to our audience, uh, I ask you to stand by because uh, at the end we have a special announcement to make. Uh, but for the moment, please help us improve the quality of our courses, contents, and delivery by completing this uh, survey. Also, uh, as always, we encourage you to propose a special topic that would be of your interest through the chat box located, uh, as always, to the right of your screen. And uh, as always, the discussion does not have to finish here. We invite you to review Badminton Pan America YouTube channel, where you can find all the conference and keep exchanging ideas. To our Badminton family, we invite you to the next session entitled Anticipation. Do you think you can coach it? On Friday, August 14th at 15 hours Lima time, where we will be happy to have the presence of coach Martin Andrew from England. And now we will connect with Badminton Pan America office located in Lima with uh, Herman who has a special announcement to make. Good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for being with us. Mark, thanks for our excellent presentation on uh, the investigation, the social, the sports science investigation you made. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all our coaches and investigators, researchers in Pan Am region to submit uh, their works, the works that they have done in the past. No, we are opening this uh, invitation so we can present two projects 
two investigations in this uh, same platform, Coach Corner. We will have, uh, today was the first presentation. We will have seven more additional from the BWF Science uh, uh, Research. And then at the last two will be from our coaches, our people here in Panam. So please, uh, you can go through our website and look for all the criteria for the invitation to submit your works. You no, know? this investigation you already made at the moment and you have it available with you and you would like to share with us in this same platform as today on a Tuesday. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks Mark again. Thanks uh, David Cabello to be with us today here and our special thanks and gratitude to our colleagues at Badminton World Federation for helping us put in this in place and have a very successful presentation and motivating us to go deeper into our sport badminton. Thanks again and see you on Tuesdays. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Herman. Thank you to our audience. We thank you for your participation. Stay well, stay safe.